couple of weeks ago in the Gulf of Mexico, oil platform from BP set on fire and oil is being split all over the Gulf of Mexico. In the meanwhile, in Europe, um, states are failing. What is happening to the world? We don't know what went wrong, but we do know that uh, BP was drilling in water that was a mile deep and the oil was actually another half mile below that through a half mile of rock. So the oil and gas in which they were drilling was under enormous pressure. And there are two questions here. One, did something go wrong in the way they were doing it? Or was the pressure from this new oil field, it's the first time anyone had drilled into it, was the pressure so great that the existing technologies could not manage it? That's, that's another question that's being asked now. If the latter, then it really raises a red flag about deep offshore drilling because you never know quite what conditions you might get into. And it may be that however successful uh, the existing technologies for offshore drilling have been um, that they may not, may not be adequate to dealing with some of the, the new problems that are arising in very deep uh, drilling, for example. Um, someone said this may be uh, the uh, Chernobyl for the, uh, the oil industry, at, at least for offshore drilling, because if this oil spill continues for months, the damage it will do ecologically and economically will be huge. The, inter the interesting thing about our national economic accounting systems today is, is that GDP will go up in the region of the Gulf of Mexico as, as everyone tries to get this under control. It'll take an enormous effort. I mean, eventually it'll go down because it will destroy so many industries from tourism and beaches and, and, uh, and as well as the, um, uh, the marine life and the fisheries uh, industry in the, uh, in the area. So we're, we're sort of on the edge now in terms of knowing whether or not we really have the technologies to comfortably and, and safely uh, drill in, in some of these areas where we, uh, we're reasonably confident there is, uh, there is oil. Th this spill, it's going to affect the way we think. And if we realize we're going to have to leave oil anyhow, why take all these risks just to get the last, the last little bit? And uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to change how we think about the future of oil and, and indeed uh, fossil fuels uh, more broadly in, in our economy. It's interesting that the, uh, the values that drive the overconsumption of natural resources are the same values that drive overconsumption of financial resources, the excessive consumption um, that exceeds uh, the capacity of, of credit systems. We see it in the United States, have seen it with a huge credit card debt for the U.S. population. It's come down somewhat now, uh, but still there's this consume today and don't worry about tomorrow. And uh, what that does is it gets you into fiscal trouble and it gets you into um, ecological or environmental trouble by overconsuming natural resources um, that eventually has an economic consequence. The biggest single problem the world is facing is that as the world economy has expanded over the last half century or so, it's increased more than fourfold in size. And what's happening is that we're consuming more of natural systems than can be sustained. Forests are shrinking. Fisheries are collapsing. Water tables are falling. Soils are eroding. Grasslands are turning into desert from overgrazing. We are slowly destroying 
well, maybe not so slowly now, we are destroying the economy's natural support systems. No civilization can survive the ongoing destruction of its natural support systems. And I have been asking myself, what, what form will this overconsumption take? How will it affect us? And my best guess now is that it will show up in terms of food shortages and rising food prices and growing political instability and more failing states. The list of failing states, that is, countries where governments can no longer provide personal security um, or food security, the list of failing states uh, is getting longer and it raises a disturbing question, which is how many failing states before we have a failing global civilization? We don't know the answer to that question. We've not been here before. The question is, what can we do and how much will it cost if we don't do it? Because if we don't do it, we're toast. Civilization will not survive, um, continuing with business as usual much longer. We have to make major changes to cut carbon emissions, to stabilize population, to eradicate poverty, which is closely related to stabilizing population, and to restore forests and fisheries and soils and aquifers and grasslands, the economy's natural support systems. It's a very complex set of issues and interactions we're looking at. Um, that's one of the problems. Another problem is that most of the advisors to national governments are economists. And there are a lot of things that economists do well, but there are some things they do not do well. They, economics does not recognize the sustainable yield uh, capacities of various natural systems. Economics just doesn't recognize them. There's nothing in economic theory that, that will explain why the Canadian cod fishery collapsed or why um, the uh, mountain, the, the, the glaciers are melting in the, um, in the Himalayas and on the Tibetan Plateau, for example. Economics does not explain why the Greenland ice sheet is melting and sea level is rising. Um, so economists are sort of excluded from the real world. They're isolated from the real world by the body of economic theory. And they always try to see who can do the best job of fine-tuning economic theory and getting it to explain what's happening. But in the most important area of all, in the relationship between the global economy and the Earth's natural support systems, economics is a failure. I've begun to realize that the economists who are advising Obama or um, uh, the Secretary General of the UN or the World Bank or um, the uh, the, the head of the EU. They don't understand what's happening in the world. And they don't understand the, the urgency of restructuring the world energy economy, for example. Economics does not explain climate change. For example, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet in the far north Atlantic could lead to the flooding of rice-growing river deltas in Asia dramatically shrinking the rice harvest. Unless you study these things, it's not intuitively obvious that ice melting on this large island in the North Atlantic that we call Greenland is threatening to shrink the rice harvest in Asia where half the world's people live. It's those kinds of complexities that we face and then beyond that, um, the dominance of economics uh, and economists in shaping public policy. And at this point, they are ill-equipped to do that. Um, half the world's people live in countries where water tables are going down, and that includes the big three grain producers, China, India, and the United States. Um, it includes a lot of smaller countries too, like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, um, uh, Pakistan, Mexico, and so forth. But what we're doing, what we're doing by over-pumping aquifers, that is pumping beyond the rate of recharge, 
is we're creating a food bubble. We are artificially inflating food production by depleting aquifers. When we deplete the aquifers, the rate of pumping will necessarily be reduced to the rate of recharge. That's not a debatable hypothesis. That's a reality. So we have some fairly sizable food bubbles that are going to be bursting one of these days. And I don't think the world is prepared for it. I mean, for example, it looks to me as though irrigated area in the United States has peaked and begun to decline. The same is almost certainly true for India. It may be true for China, we're not sure. And then there are a number of smaller countries like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, Mexico, where the same thing is happening. But what this means is that we have probably reached peak water at the same time that we're reaching peak oil. And quite a few people talk about peak oil, but not very one, not many talk about peak water. But I think we're there now, and I think I can make a convincing case that we're there, and that the world after the water peak is going to be a very different world from the one before the water peak. I mean, throughout our lifetimes, water use, irrigated area, which accounts for 70% of total water use, has been going up. And now suddenly we're going to be living in a world where it's going down. It's going to be a very different world. And we haven't really figured that out yet. The same is true with oil, of course. Throughout our lifetimes, oil production has been going like this. Now it's going to be going like this. Again, it's a very different world.